I talked to her on the phone and I said, every, how every out of every bad thing, get the good out of it for the glory of God. So here we are. I don't know what to say. And uh, I don't know what to leave because there's so much that the Lord is done. But can we sing that song? Amen. <laughs> church yesterday, Thursday, because today is Saturday, that was Thursday, and then a brother stood up, in fact he comes from Jamaica, and as he was testifying, he talked about coming to Leeds in the next two weeks, so my what can I say? Ma, 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 uh, what I loved most or what I picked out was leads, the word leads. Because uh, Brian had told me to, that I have to board a, 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 a coach from central London and then to Leeds and then I'll get another one. So when this brother stood up and says, in the next two weeks I'll be going to Leeds. So I just captured the word leads. And after the service, I went to him and said, hey, because I didn't know where leads was. 
would you please direct us where Leeds is when I get a coach from central London how do I go to Leeds how I wanted to know and then this brother said oh you want to go to Leeds I said yes that's where we're going and on Saturday and he said you have tickets we said no he said oh I'm going to give you tickets I didn't ask for tickets yeah, I didn't I didn't tell him that I didn't have the ticket <laughs> but it's amazing he said do you have tickets we said no he said no I'll give you tickets and he gave us tickets. <laughs> this, and then I knew that was God. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. Because we were talking it over with my wife and said, but how are we going? You know, and all that. You're about to go back to Uganda and all this. I said, oh, no, we have to go. <laughs> we trusted the Lord. And here is a brother. In the service. Just talked about leads. You can never know how God will come to you. He has so many ways. <laughs> you can never say, oh, this is the way. I think, let me, let me be here. The Lord is going to pass through here. He will blow your mind when he comes behind you <laughs> to meet you. Praise the Lord. First of all, uh, let me give my testimony. Uh, is so long that we can spend here five more days <laughs> when I condense it. But I try my level best <laughs> to condense it. As you see me here, I always tell people, if you have never seen a miracle, I am a miracle. I am a miracle. If you have never seen a miracle, and if you don't believe that there are miracles today, here I am. I'm a living miracle. And as I speak to you right now, I've never seen my mother. That's one thing. Another thing, I don't know my birthday. I don't know when I was born. Many people today, they want to give me birthday gifts, but I miss them because I don't know when I was born. <laughs> I grew up with my dad in a very remote area way back in Uganda, and my dad was a drunkard, drug addict man, I think, because maybe I was maybe eight, eight or seven. My dad used to go late in the night, come back in the morning. I mean, that was the kind of life we lived in. Sorry for the baby. So life was very hard. Life was very bad. Life was so hard. And I didn't know what to do. Can you imagine living with your dad at that tender age, maybe eight or nine or ten, and your dad is a drunkard man? And the only thing he could do to me was to beat me every other time. He would leave me. We're not in a house like this. We lived in a very tiny, we call them thatched hut, thatched house. It's, it's, it doesn't have a door. It doesn't have a window. It's just there. It's, it's grass. That was the kind of life. And my dad would leave me there. No food, no nothing. And one of the things, because it's too much, I try to, to pick things from here and there and there to make it a complete story. But let me tell you something. In that kind of situation, the Lord had a good plan for me at that very tender age. I remember one time, when I was at school. The reason I say maybe I was nine, because at the age of nine in Uganda, that's when children begin to go to school in those days. So when I was in school, I don't know whether it was a mother's day, 
the class teacher came to our class and she said, I want each and every one of you children to talk something about your mothers, something good about your mother. So each child would stand up and say something good about her mom. And one child would stand up and say, I love my mother because of A, B, C, D. I love my mother because before I go to school, she prepares a cup, a cup of tea. And that child will say, I love my mother because before I go to bed, she comes and prays over me. So each child would stand up and say something about the mother. And then I didn't know what to say. Then it was my time to say something. And the class said, the class just said, Paul, tell us something about your mother. And I said, bitterly crying, I don't have a mother. Everyone in the class looked at me. Class teacher came to me and said, Paul, you don't have a mother? I said, yes. And she asked, she told me, do you have, she asked me, do you have a father? I said, yes. Go back and ask your dad where your mother is. As I told you, even up to this day, I've never seen her photo. I don't know how she looks like. No one ever told me a story about my mother. Now I go back to ask my dad. And remember, I used to walk nine miles to and fro. That is 18. Nine going to school, nine coming back. Today, I find it, is, it was even more miles. But I thought that day, in those days, it was nine. I went back home. My dad came, drunkard. And I was waiting to ask him this question. And, uh, you know, back in Uganda, I don't know how it is here, but you don't just ask questions to your elder, even your elder brother. Even my dad, now I'm grown up, I can't, he can't speak to me and then I answer him anyhow. But here now I'm asking him about my mother. And today I think maybe he killed her. When I asked him about my mother, he beat me up, fell on the ground, he kicked me, blood began to come out of my nose. My mom, I was dying. I cried until I kept crying. I think I collapsed. And I hear these words. He said, Who, I never took you to school to be stubborn. How can you ask me such stupid questions? I was not asking stupid questions, I was just asking about my mother. And then he told me, I'll cut you in two, two pieces. That's why I said, maybe he killed her. He knows, he knows better. Because today, I ask, requested different pastors and their orders to go ask him where my mother was. And he said, he doesn't know. That was like two years ago. He said, he doesn't know. So I left it to the Lord. But that day, he almost killed me. And he said, I don't want to see you. Where did I go? I didn't know anybody. I didn't have a relative I know. I didn't have an uncle I could see. But just two. And now he says, I don't want to see you. I'll kill you. I found myself on the street. Life was very hard on the street. I began to eat from the garbage. For the first weeks and all that, I like hesitated, you know, not to eat from the garbage. It was so dirty. And there was no good food there. I remember somebody would come and throw a rotten piece of bread and 20 kids, street kids, we would gamble, we would run and fight for it and nobody eats it 
at the end of the day, it, it is crushed and finalized. There's no water on the street. There's nothing like, you know, blankets and all that. So I wanted to commit suicide and I said, why should I leave? I said, why should I leave? I remember there was a day, two street kid children were killed by, by the mob justice with stones. A woman was passing by and then I, I think because on the street you don't learn good manners. So maybe these children wanted to sneak, to, to, to steal out from her and she made alarms. I heard people say we are tired of street children. They got the stones, killed too. Was so frightened and there was nobody to help. That night I cried in the night and I said, I wish my mother was here. I wouldn't be suffering as I'm suffering. All I knew about was a mother or a dad. I didn't know about God. Life was very hard, miserable, difficult. And I never at any one point loved to live because I thought life was useless because of the way I lived up. You would find me on the street and think I was a mental disturbed boy because all the clothes I had, they be, began to, they turned into rags, rags. My nails grew, my hair grew, I was so skinny, dying. Oh, you would see me and know this is a mental disturbed child ready to die. But doesn't, that wasn't the case. I was adding up very well, but the way I looked like, everybody pointed at me as a mental case. You know, there are people today I tell them, it doesn't matter what you're going through. People can see and give a judgment, but God sees more than what people can see. It's amazing how I got off the street. I want to cut it now short. There is a church in Uganda. They had what they called Sunday school big day. And they told their little ones, the Sunday school children, to go back in, to go in the streets and in the villages. I wasn't there and I didn't know about this plan. But this church were planning for that Sunday school big day. So these little children come to the street. For me, you remember, I want to die. I want to commit suicide. I'm fed up with life. And this boy comes to me. He doesn't know me. He doesn't know how to preach. He doesn't know maybe the Bible. And he tells me, let's go to church. I was fed up with life. And now this boy is telling me to go to church. I even don't know what church means. I wanted something to eat. And I told, I told the, the boy, hey, get out of me. Leave me alone. Just leave me alone. And know what happened? This boy said, oh, we are going to sing, we are going to dance, we are going to clap our hands, we are going to do what? I wasn't interested. I just wanted to die, commit suicide, fed up with life. And this boy persisted and said, oh, when you go to church, we have plenty of milk. I said, milk? But I remember and I said, oh, I don't have the money. You know, people in this world, they think money is the solution. I don't know how about you. I said, I don't have the money. Money can make you buy a good house, but it cannot give you sleep. Money can make you buy good food, but it cannot give you the appetite. So it's not money. Man needs God. There is always a virtue for God to fill. 
This boy tells me now, oh, it's, don't mind about the money. It is free. Oh, it's free. I followed the boy to church. Collapsing. But I went to church. No shoes. I went to church. In rags, stinking. I followed the boy up to the church. When I arrived at church, because I was in rags, because I was thinking, if somebody would see me, maybe they had seen me on the street, and they said, this is a mental boy now, coming to church to confuse the church service. They never thought that anything good would come out of me. People in the church, that's what they thought. These people, you see, when you see somebody in the church, I mean, what, what do you think? <laughs> One of the pastors today is alive, who saw me when I first came to church. He's now in Rwanda. So he comes back to Uganda and he, he lives in my home. And uh, he always says this before people. That when I see Pastor Paul today, how he is, how transformed he is, and uh, I make a flashback how he came to church. I glorify God. <laughs> because the pastors, they told the church greeters and ushers that when that boy, mad boy makes any confusion, just call police, take him to police. But it wasn't so. I wasn't mad. I was looking for somebody to love me. I was looking for somebody to say, hey, come, here is the way. I was looking for somebody to say, come on, tell me your problem. And this is the solution. But everybody thought I was crazy, not adding up well. To I say, people can say what they say against you, but be focused. Because there is God who sees more than what people see. Because when people thought I was a mad, crazy boy, God saw something else, a world changer. God saw a great evangelist. God saw a pastor. Praise the Lord. In the church service, when this boy brought me to church, that was the end of it. I've never seen him up to this day. At times I say, maybe he was an angel. Let me tell you something. The pastor stood up to preach the words I'll never forget. He said this one, God is a father to the fatherless. If you don't have a father, God will be your father. And that was like, it straightened me up. And I said, what is that? What's that man saying? He says, if no one is taking care of you, Jesus will take care of you. I began to cry. I began to cry. I didn't know what I was saying even. But I say, God, if you are there, like this man is saying, that you are a father. See how my athlete father has cast me out of his home. Now, be my father. Take me over. That's, those are the words I spoke. And God had, had me. And I gave my life to Jesus. Right away. Gave my life to him. They closed the church service. They closed the church doors inside of me. I said, I'm not going back to the street. I'm not going back. I'll stay here. Because in this place, I have found somebody called God. He has become my father. In this place, there's somebody called Jesus. He's going to take care of me. I slept on the veranda. No one ever thought that one day I'll be in Bradford. 
No one ever thought that one day I'll stand up in Uganda and preach on radio stations and uh, TV, television stations. No one! It was only God. Not for months. For over one year, another year, I was sleeping there. They couldn't even allow me to sleep in the church. Finally, people were giving me, I was like a beggar, giving me, you know, clothes and all that. And finally, they allowed me to sleep in the church. And everybody said, oh, God is working on him. I was getting, you know, I was bathing now, you know. I remember somebody cut off my hair and all that. Get some heat here and all that. And I was always the first. Somebody would open, the pastor would open the church door. He was the first and I was always the second. I'd never missed church. All week through, 24-7. And I was crying to the Lord. I was talking to him. I was calling him as my father. And I said, Father, one of my dreams was to go back to school. And the Lord worked it out for me. I did all kinds of jobs. I was a houseboy, shamba boy. I fetched water to sell that I might get, I might get some money to pay my school fees. People, some people were abusing me. They could not, because I was a little boy, they would not pay me. But the Lord worked it out for me. Somebody in the church, a lady, took me to her home to work for her. And she was so good, good Christian. Though it was far from the church, I used to walk over 20 miles, 10, 10. But I kept coming to church. And it happened that one time this lady came to England. And she left me in the house, big house. She told me, in two days or two weeks, I'll be here. Here is food, here is what, and that was all. And you know, I was a very faithful servant. I remember she had visitors who would come in the house and they would tell, they would come to me and say, can you get us a little boy who is faithful like you that we give him a job to work for us. You know, people thought I would be there, stagnant, doing that and all that, but God had a good plan for me. So when she came to England, instead of two days or two weeks, it came to a month, three months, five months. And the owner of the house, because she was renting, came to me, said, give us the money for rent. And I thought they were speaking in tongues. I didn't know what they were saying. <laughs> Give us, because I didn't know about that. I was a little boy. Give us. When I told them, no, I'm here, I'm just working. Where is your master? She went to England. They kept on coming, and they thought that maybe she was hiding from them, that she didn't have the money. So they, they told me, tell your master that we are going to bring in another occupant. I told them, said, no, no. That's, that what, that, that's what they thought, that maybe she was hiding from them. Then they brought someone else to take over the house. I began to cry. I thought, am I going back to the street? I told the people at the church, Pastors could not help. They have their own problems. Say, where can we put the, the property of your master? We don't know what to do. But let us pray. At times it's good to pray. God answers prayers. But it's good to, for you to do something. For somebody in need. Well, when they brought in somebody to, to take over the house, when he saw me crying, I think he was touched. He went back, he went back, he went with the people who brought him to see the house and all that. And then he returned back to me. He called me and said, young boy, as they were taking me through the house, you were crying. What is the problem? 
I narrated the story to him. I am just here, I'm working, I'm not, I don't have a mother, I had my father.